Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening na pala. <laughs> it's uh, six o'clock. Uh, welcome again to the uh, Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association uh, webinar series. This is one way of uh, uh, giving our social responsibility to our uh, nation as we experience this uh, uh, pandemic. Your host and the moderator for this evening is uh, Francis Ray Suwong, the uh, Press Relations uh, Officer of the Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association. So this afternoon, uh, our topic uh, is uh, signs of COVID-19 coping behavior with our uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Ricardo uh, Guanson. But before we proceed, uh, uh, you may find uh, the PGCA on the following uh, social media platforms. Uh, you can like us and follow us uh, to, uh, through our uh, Facebook page, uh, PGCA Official. This is where our um, uh, live streaming is happening right now. Then you can follow us also on our Twitter account. Uh, PGCA, uh, official PGCA, and uh, we have also our YouTube at uh, PGCA Philippine Counselor. Uh, the rest of our uh, webinars are were already uploaded in our YouTube uh, channel. You can uh, access that. Uh, uh, you can access that now, actually. So please don't forget to subscribe and follow the uh, the PGCA on this uh, following uh, social media platforms. So uh, before we start, may I ask uh, and request uh, Father RC to lead us into prayer. Okay, can you- Father RC, you have okay, now the control of the screen. Okay. Father, please check. Okay na po. Not working. Yeah, yeah. It's there already po. Okay na po. Uh, yung... Okay. And then I cannot share my screen. Uh... Okay, Father, go ahead. Share screen a little bit. Okay, we'll start with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who in thy justice condemned man to toil by the sweat of his brow, and in thy mercy allowed that toil to bear fruit for man's edification. 
grant we beseech thee that through prayer and mortification our toil may always bear fruit for the edification of ourselves and others. And that in all our labors, we may take as our model, the cross of thy son, our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the true tree of life. Through the same Christ, our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father R.C., for leading us into uh, prayer. Now, uh, some few friendly reminders uh, for our participants. You, uh, you may type, uh, you may type in your questions uh, later on our comments, uh, a comment section of the PGSA uh, official page. Uh, we would like also to ask for the understanding of our uh, uh, participants that we are trying to answer the thousands of queries and uh, uh, please bear with us. We would like also to extend our thanks and gratitude to uh, the warm welcome and uh, uh, participation of uh, the general public, uh, to our fellow councillors, our um, allied uh, professionals or educators and the general public. Thank you for your support to this uh, webinar series of the Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association. Uh, so at the end of the webinar, please be reminded that um, you will answer your post-test and evaluation. So there is a link provided in the comment section or on a separate post in the PGSA official page. Uh, and also, uh, we have a schedule of upcoming webinars which uh, are already posted in the PGSA official page. So now this afternoon, uh, for our topic, Science of COVID-19 Coping Behavior, um, our speaker or facilitator this afternoon is a member, uh, board of directors of the Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association, and he's uh, currently the dean and professor six of the College of Medicine of Mariano Marcos State University uh, in Batac City, Ilocos Norte. So... He was also former Dean of Education of Divine Word College, Ordineta Pangasinan, and Director of Guidance Services and Program Head of Psychology of Ordineta City, Philippines. Uh, he finished his BS Psychology uh, in UP Diliman uh, and Doctor of Medicine in UP Manila in uh, 90, class of 1982. Then he took up evidence-based medicine in the college, uh, in the University College London, and CBT at uh, Beck Institute. Uh, he was born in Asingan, Pangasinan, uh, with one son Joel, uh, and uh, he has also roots in Sinait, Ilocos Sur, uh, Bacolod City, and Batac City. So this evening, we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ricardo Guanson, a Diplomate in Family Medicine and Fellow Life, Philippine Academy of Family Physicians. Doc Rick. Good evening to all the watchers out there. And welcome to uh, our series of uh, webinars sponsored by the Philippine Guidance Counseling Association. For tonight, we're going to talk about uh, the science of COVID-19 in uh, the WHO uh, due to the increase in the um, exponential increase in the cases of COVID-19. 
declared it to be a pandemic. So in March 16th, okay. President Rodrigo Duterte actually um, declared that we have a national emergency. And on June 4th, which is today, we basically have more than 20,000 cases of positive COVID. So um, this topic or a discussion will actually uh, dwell more on the uh, medical point of view, but of course we will have to look into what should have been or the, should be the ad adequate or appropriate behavior coping with this particular problem. Because this has been much discussed by my previous um, colleagues, Dr. William Montano, Francis, Father R.C., and uh, Father Ted. So there's more to come. And so welcome to the webinar for tonight. I hope I can give you a simple discussion on what it is and what's really going on. And hopefully I can do justice to the queries in your mind of ano na ba? What, what are we supposed to do? So uh, sit back and relax and you can chat or give your or comments later or even midstream, just uh, put it in your uh, uh, in the chat group area or where you can text so we can possibly answer them. Doc Rick, before we proceed, may we request uh, you to share your screen po. Share screen on the lower part, yung green. Okay, we'll do that. Doc Rick, slideshow yes. po. Here. So uh, we're going to see the science of SARS CoV and what. Dr. Rick. Yes. Uh, can you please, uh, uh, ano, slideshow po, is slideshow natin. Uh, I think it's in. Yes, yes. We're going okay. there. Is that all right? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Rick. Yeah. Okay, so good evening to everyone and uh, welcome to our uh, brief, if I may, uh, discussion on SARS-CoV-2. And I know a lot of you have uh, learned a lot already from the influx or from the discussion which you can see so much in the social media. So uh, this is uh, where I am based and um, I come here every day for the medical students and I am currently the Dean of the college and a professor in family community medicine and a professor in psychiatry. So um, this is where we have our entrance to the college and uh, we look into how to deal with this particular problem. You can see the chairs and tables are spaced apart. And we are we have started on blended learning or for some uh, online learning so our students will not come because of this pandemic. And we have to innovate and be creative as to how to deliver our lectures or our um, topics or discussion with our students. It's basically online.
Infection and disease are not really synonymous because an infection results when a pathogen invades and begin to wreak havoc within a host. The development of disease basically is a consequence of the growth of a pathogen and there is uh, impairment of tissue function. So our bodies in, have defense mechanisms to prevent infection and should those mechanisms fail to prevent disease after infection occurs. Now, uh, we are dealing with something that is basically one of the microorganisms that we know in biology or in our natural sciences. So basically you have like bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and helminths. So this all cause diseases, your bacteria can cause pneumonia, it can cause cellulitis, your viruses can cause your flu, and your fungi can cause your ringworm or your oral thrush or you uh, what do we call mumu, then you can have antamoeba histolytica causing amoebiasis, which is basically due to a protozoa, and the rest can be due to helminths like cystosoma or your cystosomiasis. And the rest, which is more or less common, are the prions, example of which is the one that causes Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses that cause illness, and so we have actually experienced them. The first one that we heard of were the severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So it is a new strain. So we say it's a novel coronavirus. Basically these are zoonotic infectious diseases transmitted from animals to humans. Detailed investigations found that the first COVID or SARS-CoV-1 was transmitted from civet cats to humans in SARS in, in that particular disease. And the second one, the hypothesis is from, from bats mediated by snakes or pangolins, which transmitted to humans, but is still under continuous investigation. And of course, the other one was from uh, dromedary camels to humans. And we have the uh, coronaviruses among animals that have not yet transferred or infected humans. So this is actually a, a, a diagrammatic or, or a picture um, representation of the virus where you can see that you have your corona-like, you now you have your E protein, S protein. Of course, this is for microbiology. I won't really bother you so much about this. It's just to impress upon you. This is basically how it looks under the microscope, but this is actually um, stained or uh, we stylized it. And you can see further, there you go, uh, the core. Um, you have this uh, beautiful look of your coronavirus, which affects have upon human society today. So actually, why is it uh, SARS-CoV-2 or, uh, or uh, what do you call it, uh, COVID-19? Because as early as this is being a challenge, because they say it's not really in December, but basically even earlier in November where uh, cases from Wuhan, China were identified. How do we get it? So it can be not only this, but basically our microorganisms can, we can have them either through direct or indirect contact. So when we say it's direct, you actually ingest an infected meat by touching an infected person or being bitten. Now, transmission can also be direct by, this is the basic problem or basic issue with our COVID-19. You can get it either from aerosol or from droplets. So your indirect can be the reason for your disinfecting your doorknobs, the reason for disinfecting your floor, and the reason for leaving your shoes outside of the house because you can have up with the pathogen there and they would stay there for a certain period of time. So these are indirect. That's the reason why they tell you, you do not touch your nose, your eyes, uh, and other people, no handshakes because you can have indirect contact with the microorganism. Uh, a few um, important uh, details, which I would like to share with you, is uh, the sizes of the different microorganisms and relative to other important uh, things that we do handle. Like for example, our, the hair, and of course, how do we measure? Early, early on, when I first reported this, about the size of the coronavirus, we say it's a large, it belongs to the large family of coronaviruses, somewhere like 400 to 500 nanometers. But as uh, data came in, it was found out that 
like in the UK studies, they say it's about 100 to 200 nm, and even 70 to 90 or 0.7 to 0.9 microns. So if you would like to know what is the uh, uh, specific uh, measuring device or uh, um, we transpose, one nanometer is basically one billionth of a meter and that's how small it is. You will see in the next slide, okay, there's a human here, basically 100 to 300 microns. The N95, which is the more popular one today, which I would like to show to you later. The N95 basically was found out that uh, was uh, actually, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, structured in a way that in such a way that 95% of the time, it blocks the entry of microorganisms 0.3 microns or 300 nanometers. Now, the diameter of the coronavirus in the recent study showed it is that it could be from 60 to 140, so it's little, a, a really a little smaller. Oh, this is a, a picture of the comparison of a standard your PM10 and of course your red blood cell and then uh, your bacillus and then your viruses if you're to your extreme left. You can see the size, it's 0.007 uh, micrometer or, or rather nanometer. Yeah. Oh, this is just to show there was a study done and what was the study? Okay, the study of uh, Nancy Leung et al, where they, they try to see respiratory viruses shedding and exhaled breath and efficacy of face masks because we are asked to do don face masks. On the average, they found out that viral shedding is higher in nasal swab compared to throat swabs, which means to say that if we take a bath, it's also very important for us to clean our noses or um, inside of it, uh, the intranasal portion. It's not just washing the face, but we also have to gurgle and clean our noses because you have a lot of viruses, if ever, that would have been there inside. And what was the finding of the group? Surgical face mask significantly reduced detection of influenza virus RNA in respiratory droplets and coronavirus RNA in aerosols with a trend towards this reduction of coronavirus RNA in respiratory droplets, which means to say they can effectively filter. So here, they conclude surgical face masks could prevent transmission of human coronaviruses, influenza viruses in symptomatic individuals. And we have discussed this one a while ago. So look at this. There was a study conducted by Paddy Robertson et al. They would like to make a comparison among uh, you see the use of your, your mask, where you see they had these uh, um, um, factors. One, the group not wearing anything of any mask, one wearing a cotton handkerchief, which basically what impedes or blocks 28% of the virus. The surgical mask, which I will show later to you, basically inhibits or uh, filters or blocks 80% of the microorganisms. And um, the 8812, well, it's branded here, 3M, but we can have other brands. It basically what, it's almost 99%, the, the, uh, or rather, it's like a 96 or 97% and the Teflon filters. This, this is actually comparing the filtration ability capability of these different forms of masks that we now use. Of course, here it is in another study, the researchers actually shot actual viral par particles on N95 masks. The mask captured over 95% of virus particles, which just proves to us that it is very effective in preventing access of the microorganisms to the face or to the person. In conclusion, masks including surgical masks and N95 can capture viruses and even particles over 10 times smaller. So this is actually the graph there where you can see the peak. Uh, you can see that it's 6% no? particle diameter. The bigger there is the greater filtration. They cannot come in to your right, okay? To the right of the graph. Now, this is again another graphical rep representation of uh, several uh, mass that capture 99% of tiny, even 0 0.01 micron particles. So, I keep on repeating why 
it tells us that wearing a mask, regardless of the quality, or rather, regardless of the type, like if it's Teflon, if it is a surgical, if it's KN95 or N95, they will still effectively prevent access of the microorganisms in the person. Can masks protect people from the coronavirus? Masks can filter particles as small as 0 0.007 microns, 10 times smaller, and we said that already, which means that they are surgical masks, don't work as well as N95, but they are cheaper and more readily available, and they can still filter. Useful alternative. In fact, there is a new study conducted by, uh, reported by Jonathan of uh, Boston University School of Medicine, published in the AJIC, Journal of Infection Control recently, that you can treat your surgical mask with saline solution or even sea water, and you can use even a uh, paper towel to soak them and then let it dry. It effectively increases its ability to filter microorganisms. The salt in the water forms a molecular bond like a lattice uh, uh, um, um, way in the lattice way. So, and then when the salt dissolves for a second and then it dries up, what happens? It traps the virus inside the lattice. So, you may probably want to venture or look into this. You can wet your mask, though, so you can wet and in a salt solution or sea water. So, what happens when we cough? Why do we? Uh, why do we? Say, why do they say we have to uh, cover our mouth? Or cover even our noses. You see, this has been a study conducted uh, a few weeks ago, I think it's almost a month or so, that you can develop actually infection from aerosols and from droplets. When they did a study, because we now recommend that you must be at least one to two meters apart from your, uh, from your, the one, from your company, the one who's with you, but if you would see when they did an experiment, it extended beyond six meters, which means to say that for this not to happen, you have to close your mouth or put a, a, a barrier so that you can have your large droplets even going far because it will not be dependent on the initial velocity of the way you cough. So if it's a big cough, it's a powerful laugh. You still transmit large droplets far, far away. One of the reasons why we are being told to not to face each other, you'd be uh, one to two meters apart. You can see another graphical presentation here, a drawing that you can infect people even by just talking and even by just simple sneeze or cough. So because this can lodge or, or, or uh, can stay in, uh, in uh, the things that we use, the spoon, the fork and everything. So we really have to be careful with this. Now, uh, why do we disinfect as often like three times a day or after a clinic or after you see someone because they found out that uh, the virus is viable or still alive in this number of hours or days. So I'd like to point out the face mask. So it could be there for seven days. So caution, if you probably need to recycle your surgical mask, which we do not recommend, but if at all you have nothing, you sun dry. But if it is KN95 or N95, you do not dry it in the sun because you will destroy the lattice created uh, there is an ionic bond or response inside that uh, N95. If you have to dry it, do not put it under the sun, but actually just air dry, if at all. But you can see, you can also use the, the, the uh, clothes, no, or tela that we say, because it can still be effective. Now you see, for your glass and for the plastic, for those of you who have clinics and for those of you who have your barrier, which are your plastic, you have to clean that plastic at the end of the day because your virus can be there and would stay for five days. In surgical gloves, it's eight days. Of course, this is the drawing to show it to you. Uh, this is not my drawing. There is a reference at the end or at the lower portion of the drawing. So they say, and they've been saying that SARS-CoV-2 basically 80% smiled and only 5% going to the critical stage. This is basically the current findings. So this may change over time as we collate and vet and curate all the information worldwide and even in our national um, um, uh, repository, which is basically the Department of Health. So what happens? What do you know you have? So it's basically like ordinary symptom of flu. What is it? You have fever, headache, dry cough, myalgias or muscle pains, abdominal discomfort, 
difficulty of breathing, diarrhea, and the like. Now, it's very important. It's very important to identify that you have to look into its incubation period. So uh, I borrowed this slide from the DOH. We also use that to see if our uh, workers who probably would like to go back to work, they do not, you have to test for symptomatology like do they have sore throat, body pain, static fever, and flu-like symptoms. Oh, the incubation period, this is very, very important. The incubation period is basically the time you get the infection, it would take you hours or days before you manifest. So if you have uh, infection on June 1, then when you have cough on June 5, the incubation period would be between June 1 and June 5. So that is the incubation period. And when they did a study, this is a China data or data, it's basically 5.1 days, or it should be between five to six days. But on the average, you can have the fifth to 11th day, almost 100 symptoms have been manifested. So what is this? This is the reason for the quarantine for 14 days. Why are you being asked to stay for 14 days? Because they found out that at the 14th or even the 11th, almost all the symptoms associated with COVID will be out. So they can see if you are asymptomatic or you start to develop symptoms. So they would know if there is a need for you to be confined, quarantined, or be given medication. Of course, as I have said, these are basically the symptoms that you can see, fever, cough, headache, shortness of breath, uh, diarrhea, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, flu. No. So ito, it's the same, these are different studies it's still showing to you the signs and symptoms of those who developed uh, COVID-19 from the group, uh, from the study of Wang et al, Chen, Wang, and Zhou. So. Again, the clinical course, which I will show a little uh, later, what happens, you have fever cough for 12 days, 90. Look at cough, it is the longest symptom that is hard to be recovered. You still have cough for 19 days so since admission. So of course, on the second week, you can develop problems, uh, pulmonary or respiratory problems. Now, this is a very busy slide. It's just saying to, to us, the upper portion is the group of survivors. Ito yung mga nabuhay, yung mga nasa uh, taas na graph. Ano ang diferensya doon sa mga hindi nabuhay? First, look at cough, yung blue sa taas. The survivors and the non-survivors parehong inuubo hanggang sa dulo. Okay. But if you see, there is now, uh, if you try to look at literature and even stories in the internet from the different research centers and hospitals, they would tell you that, look at the violet, systemic corticosteroid, and invasive ventilation. When a person is ventilated or intubated, nilalagyan ng tubo para makahinga. Sabi nila, it is the end of the day. Because if you see in this particular comparative graph, hindi nagkaroon ng intubation yung mga nabuhay. But in fairness to medical doctors and the healthcare workers, they have devised good medication and good strategies that so that even those intubated can survive. For those who are in the know, alam nyo na tinataob yung pasyente a uh, prone position while they are being ventilated. It is being done now because there is an increased oxygenation of the blood kapag nakataob. Kaya nakataob sila. And then, ang problema, magtatagalog na ako bakit ang problema dito ay mas kinaka nagbe-ventilate tayo, namamatay yung pasyente. Because you cannot actually have gas exchange, oxygenation is a problem because wallen yung mga at saka may coagulation na yung mga ugat at mga blood vessels at sa mga organ systems. So ang nangyayari, hindi na makahing, walang delivery ng oxygen, the body will die, the person will die. They have one way of uh, bypassing this. I, it is not part of my discussion here. May tinatawag silang ECMO, extracorporeal mechanical oxygenation. Imbis na yung dugo pupunta sa baga, yung dugo pupunta sa sang makina, kung saan doon i-deliver ang oxygen. So, Kung titignan nyo ang mga literature o mga nagsuri, yung mga pasyente na hin nahirapang huminga at may makina ang ospital ng ECMO, doon idinadaan yung dugo. They have a higher chance to survive because gas exchange happens. Parang dialysis yun, no? 
yung maduming dugo pinapalitan ng bago. Ito naman yung dugong kulang ng oxygen binibigyan ng oxygenation. So, there are two ways to diagnose. No? Among doctors, pinagtatalunan yan ng mga iba bang organisasyon. Pinagtatalunan in a way that we really like, would like to come up with the best evidence. So, we are doing, sinasabi nilang real-time polymerase chain reaction. Itong sinasabing uh, biosafety laboratory, kailangan kasi ng mga personal protective equipment yan. No? At yung isa naman, yung tinatawag natin RAP, no? rapid antibody test. Magkaiba yan. No? Yung una, yung RT-PCR, you check for the presence of the antigen. In short, meron bang dalang mikrobyo itong tao na ito? So para malaman natin, we do oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal swab. Maglalagay, kukuha ka ng sample doon sa ilong o doon sa bibig ng pasyente sa, sa dulo at ilalagay mo yon sa isang container at itetest mo sa isang makina. No? Pag merong laman na virus yun, Ibig sabihin may protina ng virus. Magpa-positive yan. Ayun sinasabi nilang positive PCR. Ngayon, yung isa naman, tinatawag naman natin na antibody test. Doon sa antibody test, hindi natin sinusukat yung antigen kung may mikrobyo. Ang sinusukat natin, kung may mikrobyo ba ito, kung may mikrobyo ba ito ay uh, lumaban ba ang katawan? Meaning to say, did the body have an immune response response rather so the immune response is you develop an antibody to counter the effect of the antigen yung antigen mo that is your microorganisms that is your sars cov 2 yun ang pangalan ng microbio ng covid-19 so but then there are issues between these two and even within themselves bakit kailan siya nagpa-positive kailan siya nagne-negative tingnan niyo yung nandito sa uh, rapid flow IgG. IgM yan po yung antibody immunoglobulin M ang tawag dyan, yung isa immunoglobulin G. Itong dalawang ito, magkasunod na lumalabas. No? Ito na naman ang problema natin. Different researchers give us different times. Sabi ng iba, lalabas siya yung day 11 ng ang, uh, IgM. Tapos susunod ng IgG. Sabi ng iba, mas maaga siya. Seven days pa lang, meron na. Therefore, kung ikaw ay magtetest nito at kulang ka pa sa araw, Magne-negative pero meron na pala. Kaya we have such a thing as we call uh, the sensitivity and the specificity. Ito yung mga makina ng uh, PCR. Okay. Okay, look at this. For example, on day one, na-expose ka, meron ka ng mikrobyo, may uh, SARS-CoV ka na, no, na virus. Pag tinest mo ng PCR yan, wala ka pang makikita. So it will take about, uh, in this particular study, it should take you like five days, which is, that is when you start to develop symptoms. The virus gets into you between June 1, 2, 3, 4, you are all right. However, what happens is, on the first day of symptoms, biglang lumabas, Okay, biglang lumabas yung iyong ano, uh, ubo at sipon. That is your incubation period is between day 1 to 5. If you take the test, yung June 1, pumunta siya sa'yo ng June 6, 62% ang chance na mag-positive siya. Which means to say, pwede pa rin siya mag-negative. Pero if you try to see the third day of the symptom, yung ubo lumabas magbilang ka ng tatlong araw. So tatlong araw na ako akong umuubo. 80% of these people or 80% chance you will have a positive PCR. Ang nung ibig sabihin nito, hindi ka basta magtetest kasi baka kulang pa ng araw, negative talaga makukuha mo. Kasi you have to at least, sabi nga dito, day 11 actually. Tingnan ninyo to sa day 21 sa third week, wala nang symptoms pero positive pa rin. So sabi niya, ang recommendation, best to test on day 5 to 8 post-exposure. Yung ikalimang araw na na-expose ka kasi meron na yan. Ang tanong dyan, bakit nagpa-positive pa rin, sir, yung ano, gumaling na? Kasi you are measuring actually already the fragments of the virus. These are non-viable. Hindi na sila nakakakos ng sakit. Pero positive ka pa rin. Kaya meron sinasabi nilang false positive. Pwede hindi false yun. Positive talaga pero magaling na. Contagion. Okay? The PCR can remain positive for to 8 weeks. So ilan yan? 2 months positive ka. Magaling ka na yan. No? 
but people are no longer contagious by the second week. And according to Dr. Edsel Saldana, Saldana from PISME, UPPJH, on the 11th day, hindi na raw nakakahawa yung tao. So hindi mo na kailangan ng 14 days. But then, of course, we have to collate no, and see uh, these results kasi ibig sabihin yan, if this is true, we can send our suspect, those uh, that did manifest or even asymptomatic. On the 11th day, pwede nang umumay kung wala pang lumalabas. So, uh, normally, that should be it. So, time window until infection test positive. Sa swabbing, swabbing, it's, swabbing is not a test. The swab is a method. Okay? When you swab the nasopharyngeal area, you get less than 62% when it is still three days. So, beyond para higher ang ano mo. So, kung may, uh, you get infection on day one, magbilang ka ng three days after that, that's the time to do the swab. Okay, ang ginagamit natin diyan yung sa ilong at sa bibig. Yung isa naman, yung sa serology, ang ginagamit natin diyan pinprick yung dugo para matest natin para sa rapid antibody test. Okay, I have told you about this na it comes later. Siya yung So if you want to test now, halimbawa kung merong sakit, ang gagamitin mo PCR. Yung rapid antibody test gagamitin mo lang yan although hindi naman hindi, uh, kung Yung tao ba ay nag-develop ng antibody? Kasi pag may antibody, ibig sabihin may exposure. Pero ang tanong, pag may antibody ba, ibig sabihin magaling na hindi rin tayo sure. Kasi hindi na maraming klase ng antibodies, the neutralized antibody, monoclonal, mga yon na sinasabi. So what is the take-home message here? It will take time bago mag-positive ang IgG or IgM or antibody test. Okay, sabi ng mga scientists at mga researchers, kailangan natin ng, kung ang ating RAT or RAT or rapid antibody test ang gagawin, kailangan natin ng sensitivity 90%. Anong ibig sabihin nun? Ibig sabihin, kung ikaw ay may sakit talaga ng COVID at tinest ka nito, magpapositive ka. Kasi meron ka eh. Pag nagpositive ka sa test na yon ang tawag doon sensitivity. Highly sensitive. However, if there is a person who does not have the disease, and you test it, and the testing results showed negative, it has a high specificity. Meaning to say, pag wala kang sakit, pag tinest ka niya, dapat negative yung result. Ang tawag natin dun po ay specificity of the test. Okay, ito yung gumawa ng study. Yung grupo ni Zhao, Jian Xuan. Ito yung sinasabi ko kanina that there is a rise actually of your antibody presented as IgM, IgG beyond day 10, 9, 10, 11, 12 at saka palang aakit. And I have to forewarn you, several studies may point to different graphs. No? Ito yung study ng grupo na to, okay? Where do you get the, the specimen? San ho ba kinukuha yun? Pwede sa, uh, pwede sa sputum, pwede sa saliva, pwede sa uu, pwede sa dugo. Ito yung mga makikita ninyo, ang pinakamataas ay yung bronchial velar labage. No? Lalagyan ng uh, fluid yung baga, tapos ilalabas kayo kasi ilalabas mo. Marami doon. No? Yung iba, brush pa. Pang doktor na po ito, enough na meron tayong nasal swab at pharyngeal swab. Ito rin, eh, briefly, kung titingnan ninyo, yung unang-una, incubation period, wala pang sakit. Yan yung wala siyang problema. Tapos may lumabas, prodromal. Dito, dito nagtatalo ang mga scientists. Magbibigay na pa tayo ng gamot pag na-test na positive o pa-uuwi na ika-quarantine. Nakita naman ninyo no, ang naging problema abroad. No? Pinauwi yung nurse na nag-serve kasi nag-positive pero walang simptomas. A few days later, pakain na doon sa kanyang apartment. So between the prodrome and the outright development or, or of or symptoms, uh, frank development, kailangan unahan na ng gamot yan, gamutin na ng mas maaga. So it's a choice between the doctor and the patient and the family kung anong gagawin na. Next. Ito po, when they, did to, when they did an analysis of those patients, they found out that those patients who had critical conditions and who died were those patients who had advanced ages, had diabetes mellitus, had problems with... Uh, lung function o pulmonary and cardiovascular diseases. Ito yung nakita nila. Ito yung reason na they do not allow seniors to go out. It's because when you get infected, the chance of dying is higher compared to the younger population. 
So what did we recommend? Non-pharmaceutical, physical distancing, at least one meter or more. Sabi ng study, decreases infection by 80%. And wearing a face mask reduces risk of infection by 85%, regardless of the type of mask. But then, of course, when you're in the hospital, you have a different uh, setting there. There are appropriate personal protective equipment for PPEs or appropriate face masks for every condition and for every setting. Okay, I wasn't supposed to put this there, but one of my colleagues was asking me, are you, are you not going to discuss about uh, the medication? Actually, I wouldn't want to deal with this because uh, this is not a medicine lecture, but then maybe just to give you an idea, these are the drugs that we're using, okay? You have your chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. We've been using this for our malaria patients. Azithromycin, we've been using this for our respiratory uh, RTI, respiratory tract infection patients. Remdesivir, which is basically being studied now. Lupinavir, ritonavir. These are groups of antiviral, pabipiravir, your ribavirin, which we are using for, for our uh, viral hepatitis and some other viral infection. Interferon, also for hepatitis and other conditions. You have your convalescent plasma. Ito ho yung mga gumaling na. Pag gumaling ka na kasi, ibig sabihin, meron, your body fought. You develop uh, effective antibodies to fight against the microorganism. Yan yung hinakinukuha ng mga UPPJH doctors para ibigay dun sa mga severely or critical uh, COVID patients. Steroids, discussion malaki ito. Nandiyan yung fabunan controversy kung kailangan bang ibigay talaga ito mga, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, no? Or steroids. No? Then we have your yung medyo na uso ngayon yung anti interleukin six or interleukin six inhibitors available today, otherwise known as tocilizumab. Immunomodulator siya yung medyo uso ngayon. Magbibigay ako very brief. Okay, you cannot just give these drugs because these are the problem. Ang problema ho natin actually, our problem is basically cardiovascular because of prolongation of the QT interval. Na sinasabi sa ECG ang mga doktor nang nakakalam yan for sadness the point is. To cut it short, pwede kong mag-sudden death at cardiac arrhythmia. Biglang mag-iba yung pitik ng heart. Pwede ka maka you can have hepatitis, decrease in wet blood cell, and an allergic reaction, anaphylaxis. So ito yung hydroxychloroquine. We use it for arthritis patients, available as Plaquenil. It's also used for uh, lupus erythematosus, yung mga may SL. Ginagamit ho nila yan. So it is there, but actually you have to have cardiovascular clearance. And by the way, I am not endorsing any of these drugs. I'm just making a... Uh, presentation, please do not use any of these drugs because you have to be seen by a doctor for its uh, propriety. These drugs are, we, we call them investigational drugs. Of course, not hydroxychloroquine. No? Yung mga ibang drugs, investigational, off-label. Pag sinabing off-label, hindi yan yung indication niya, iba. And then yung iba for compassionate use kasi wala nang makita ng ibang gamot kung hindi ito. Kaya out of compassion, gamitin na. But then the issue here would be ethics and informed consent, yung mga payag ba sila? So, uh, I will not uh, uh, show this anymore. Mga dosing, never mind. Okay, citromycin. This one is commonly, uh, is now, ito yung sinasabi na yun, uh, worldwide na parang maganda ang e effect ng remdesivir. No? Uh, this came from a company based in China, but it's an American company, Gilead Sciences, so remdesivir. It was tested before for the Ebola. Of course, there's now an Ebola problem in Africa. This is the interleukin-6 inhibitor. Ano ibig sabihin nito? Kasi po, pag meron sa sakit na ito, ang nangyayari, yung mga immunomodulated uh, modulator cells na ang tawag dito, um, for example, yung mga lymphocyte, ito mga yan, lalabanan nila yung mikrobyo. Kaya lang, masyado silang madami. No? Para labanan, ang nangyayari, pati yung mga normal parts function ng cell at ng organ, affected. So ang gagawin no bibigyan mo ngayon siya ng immune suppression. Ito yung ginagamit nila no to silisomab para hindi magkaroon ng tinatawag nga nila dito ay cytokine storm. Na yan usually nagiging problema ng mga pasyente. Of course, hindi ko nababasahin lahat, napakarami nito. Pag uminom kayo, these are the things that can happen to you so be careful. Pardon for the typo which I can see the uh, loss of appetite. Okay, ito na tayo, which is basically our issue. So how do we cope with this? The coping mechanism is actually adaptation, the way we adjust to what is happening to our environment. At sabi ng psychologists at counselors, the Philippines is very known for its resiliency. So how do you adapt? How do you adjust? There must be a conscious effort. 
In fact, the reason I made that explanation a while ago with uh, uh, about the pandemic, about COVID-19, we have coping strategies. I won't go into details. This is very academic, appraisal focused, problem focused, okay? Emotion focused or operation focused coping. What do we mean by this? Before I discuss this, okay? When we have something, when we are fearful of something, we either, and to quote even uh, Dr. Francis or Francis uh, in his lecture, what do you do? You either fight or flight, or sabi pa niya, you freeze. So you have to look into how to adjust to what's happening. Either you change your mindset, ay, hindi naman nakakatakot siyan. I, I just have to practice prevention, quarantine and everything. So these are the system, the way we behave because we think that way. So let us be careful with our thinking. Let us not exaggerate. If you fear something, stop listening to fearful news. In fact, I don't even want you, of course, no, it's just a request. On watching the count of the Department of Health, how many cases do we have? How many turned positive today? How many died? How many recovered? It is very scary for some. So I think if this is the way it adds to your anxiety, stop watching this counting. Why? Because there's such a thing as the principle of psychological uncertainty. Of course, I'm not talking about Heisenberg's uh, psycholo uh, uncertainty in physics, but it's basically similar to this. When you are uncertain of something, you have an elevated anxiety. However, if um, you know what is going to happen, even though you have anxiety, you more or less know if they tell you, sir, we're going to do this procedure, you will experience a little pain like 30%. Then when the procedure is done, you're expecting something like 30%. But when you tell the patient or anybody, you're going to experience pain, I don't know what's the magnitude because it is very subjective, you start to be more worried. That is uncertainty. It causes anxiety. One of the reasons why I started with the lecture on what this particular problem is. So you can even have worse comes to worse, develop mental health problems like addiction, anxiety, manic depression, we now call it bipolar problem, depression, and to the extreme, you can develop psychosis, schizophrenia. And the worst that can happen is we have negative coping uh, mechanism. If you cannot um, address the issue, you are scared, you use alcohol to forget about it, uh, to be intoxicated, you use drugs, you overeat, and other risky and unhealthy behavior come in. So this is stress. I will be very fast with this because we're running out of time. When there is a stressor, you can develop all increase in heart rate, in breathing, because this is what? Based on psychophysiologic reaction. And we can see we're going to be very fast here. Look at this. Our body evaluates the situation and decides if it is stressful. Therefore, you have sensation, but let us not forget perception because you interpret what you feel. That's why perspective here is very, very important. Before you make a de decision, like for example, in, the, in our uh, social media, think before you click, meaning to say, Yung sinasabi ba? Tama ba yun? At yung iniisip mo ba? Yung ba? So perspective is very important here. That's why, okay, I went into medicine here. When you have a situation that is uh, thought as uh, stressful by the person, you now have activation of what we call the hypothalamopituitary axis. So anong mangyayari dyan? The, pituitar, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and then <clears throat> they produce substances. Ano yun? Papakita na lang natin. We call that the sympathetic medullary pathway response for the fight or flight, for the acute phase. Yung unang reaction mo, pero yung matagal, yung naghihintay ka ng problema, anong darating, anong mangyayari, you regulate, is regulated by the HPA system. Bilisan ko na po ito. Ito yan, yung hypothalamus, sa brain, pati yung pituitary. Yung mga yan, they secret substances to make us be worried, to make us hypertensive, mataas ang blood pressure to make us uh, uh, have um, cardiac rate, mabilis ang titik ng puso. And then immune suppression, madaling magkasakit kasi there is immune suppression of the immune function. 
So lahat ng iyan, okay? Uh, increase in blood sugar. So you always feel sick. Then you add, uh, increase, uh, stimulate your medulla. Yung sinasabi ko kanina. Increase in pulse rate. Ito na, yung brain, you can develop problem. Increase adrenaline and cortisol. You are stressed. You can have liver problem. You can have problems with the lungs. You can have problems with the heart. All of these, no? which are actually which are actually manifestations of the stressful condition because you do not know. Okay? So the WHO said, of course, it's normal to feel sad, stressed, and confused. So what does it mean? Talk to people that you can trust. Talk with them. You can, if you had need to stay at home, stay at home. And of course, make your home not an isolation area, but an area where your loved ones will be there. Do not go into negative thinking okay you gather information that's why i did that's what i did a while ago i told you information so that you will have decisions based on evidences and based on well thought uh strategies so limit worrying and agitation stop watching upsetting media or news you can draw on your skills when you had a problem like this how did you do how did you fail and then for children uh, this is very busy. For children, give them time. You innovate. If you have routine, let them do their routine. Explain to them within the language they could understand what's happening. Tell them what is probably the future that can happen. Show them love and care that you are there for them. That is actually what this is all about for children. Of course, they should be close to their parents and guardian. If one is away, at least be in contact using media, your telephone, cell phone, and the like. Okay? Okay, tell them also within their understanding facts about what's happening. So for older adults, ito yung mga 60 plus, 65 and above. Of course, fear and anxiety, what will happen to them. So give them a break. Let, don't let them watch um, news that tells about the pandemic, what's going on, how many died. I, don't, I think it's counterproductive for them to be watching it every day. And then, of course, this was discussed by Dr. Julian Montano. You can have breathing exercises or meditation, stay healthy, exercise, eat the right kind of food, and then avoid the alcohol and drugs because they are not healthy alternatives. Then you can contact your healthcare provider, and I would like to thank NCMH in collaboration with PGCA. We're doing this to address the issues of our frontliners and even the public or FWs. If there are things that are make them sad or any uh, uh, psychological issues, they can contact because there is a layer of uh, referrals in this group. So your coping strategies, you have to take time out, okay? eat well-balanced diet, enough sleep, breathing, meditation. Do your best, whatever you can do, because iba ang may alam. Be realistic. Be purveyors of truth, no fake news. Learn to love yourself and others. Be an inspiration to people. Live life each moment, each day, and enjoy it. Learn to, learn to live with others. You are not alone. You are not an island. And be connected spiritually. What is the message? Why is this happening? I have seen a lot of spiritual messages, and I like it and love them. Thank you, and I hope I did it very fast because I don't want to run out of time. This is way up the north, so when... Um, GCQ or ECQ or modified GCQ will be out. Please do come and visit Northern Philippines. Thank you so much for the privilege of talking with you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Doc Rick, for that very um, comprehensive and informative discussion about uh, uh, COVID-19 and uh, our coping uh, behavior. Uh, actually, I've uh, been reading uh, sa ating mga questions sa Facebook uh, live and actually it's a very uh, it's very clear that some are uh, don't have uh, the information available uh, regarding the COVID-19 that would lead uh, uh, to our reactions or behavior. Now, at this time, uh, we would like to ask uh, the patients and apologies of, uh, to our participants. Uh, 
uh, we are very much overwhelmed with your questions and your part and your participation. Uh, however, we only pick uh, some questions for uh, for Doc Rick to answer. So, Doc Rick, siguro, uh, the first question is that uh, regarding the PCR and uh, the rapid test. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So, what what if uh, so why did some cities do rapid tests before the PCR? Wasn't uh, that a waste of rapid tests? Uh, I mean, siguro let's actually, uh, actually let's hammer. Go ahead. Okay, sige. Actually, uh, most doctors would say it's a waste of resources. In fact, uh, we do not recommend rapid testing, even for employees going back to the offices. Because as I said, instead of looking at it, it is time-based. And at the same time, the gold standard for the diagnosis of your, uh, what do you call this, um, COVID-19 is a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction test. It is the one that you use. Basically, antibody testing will only tell us that you had, you had it. So we are not even sure if you have antibody, if you are protected or protective. So it is a false assurance because there is still this sensitivity and a specific problem and the time base because it will take time for it to become positive. Basically, it's on the 10th, 7th, 10th, or 11th, and 15th day, it will be positive. And by that time, you had what? You had exposed yourself to people. So people have been exposed to you. So we do not really recommend. We'd rather look at quarantining for 14 days and look if symptoms come out. So it's cheaper because let them stay for 14 days or even 11 according to uh, Edsel. They can stay for 11 days or so. If there is no symptom, they, they can probably be uh, okay. So you can let them go back. But actually there is um, a recommendation by the Philippine College of Occupational Medicine, the PSMID, the DOH, and certain other groups with respect to this. So it is not uh, economical to do rapid testing. We can miss a lot of these patients. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Doc Rick. No? Uh, and uh, it's uh, good, siguro, because uh, marami tayong participants as of now. We have uh, more or less 5,500 uh, viewers, uh, FB Live. Uh, at this time. And I hope uh, they can also bring the information to their own uh, local government uh, units regarding this one that uh, it's a waste of uh, resources yes. uh, when we do the rapid testing. Yes. Uh, yes. Another question, Doc Rick. Uh, what if there's really no vaccine to produce to counter the COVID? What will be, the, what will be your prognosis? Uh, well, will this be possible? Uh, well, yes, actually, go ahead. Uh, two things. Um, because right now, the strategy that we are employing is test, treat, and trace. Okay. Now, the question is, what if there is no vaccine that will come out? Actually, there will be a vaccine in the future. It's a matter of time. So we just rely on what we call herd immunity. If you have more, pe more people who are, who are infected, asymptomatic, or who are... Mm -hmm. Uh, who are not critical, sooner or later, you will have herd immunity to this problem. That is, it's a population-based um, uh, experience. Now, if you do not have a vaccine, then we have to follow preventive measure because the vaccine thrives only if it has a host. So, so that it will not transfer, what do you do? You do not touch a person. You do not hug a person that you do not know. You use face mask, face shield, you use protective equipment, quarantining or distancing. Because if you do not get out of the house, the virus will have nothing, nobody to go to. So it will just die. That's the reason why this government and even governments worldwide imposed quarantine so that you will not transmit. Remember the reproductive rate it was 2.3 or transmission rate. For everyone infected, they were able to compute 2.3 person will be infected. And in this 2.3, they will infect each of the each of the to another 2.3. And they want to stem that to stop that. That's one of the reasons why they quarantine people. Don't get out if you are not sure 
of where you are going and you're not sure of your activity and you're not even sure of the status of the people outside. It is the best way to prevent. So people should not really be gathering. That is the reason why they disallow us or encourage us or discourage us from being more than 10 or 15 people. Darating din yon. So prevention, if there is no vaccine, prevent. And ultimately prevention is there is no transmission. If there's no transmission, the virus will just die and disappear. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Doc Rick. Uh, before we proceed to the next uh, question, uh, for our for the certificates uh, last June 2 webinar, uh, if you have corrections or invalid email, so please uh, do email or or message the PGCA certificate at gmail.com. We will post that later. Okay, just a reminder. Po. So we will have a separate email for corrections and invalid emails. Uh, quest next question, Doc Rick. Uh, let's deal with uh, asthma. Kasi, uh, I think we have two questions here dealing with asthma. First is, uh, are asthmatic prone to COVID infection? And it's follow-up question. Uh, what would you suggest na mga dapat gawin na mga individuals na may asthma and uh, those who have respiratory problems or concerns? Okay. Uh, I am not a pulmonologist, but based on the findings, the reason why they, because one of the most affected organ, organs, one of the most affected organs is the lungs, because that is where gas exchange occur, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, to, to have asthma will be an additional compromise problem for the patient, because one of the most affected part is the lungs, and then you still have asthma. And at the same time, it's also <clears throat> difficult for you because you can also transmit the, if you have a problem, because they usually nebulize and you aerosolize the uh, microorganism if you have it. So those asthmatic patients, the reason why we discourage them is because from the beginning, they have already some sort of compromised lungs, meaning to say they can develop bronchospasm somehow for any pathogen or even for an allergen. And when they develop that and you have COVID, so it's resting on probably a, a partially destroyed house because there is already a problem and you will add another problem. That is basically the reason. Now, if I may forewarn you, that is more theoretical than uh, actual because we are basing everything from studies that come in. So, so far, asthma is one of those, but in the same top, ang top actually is cardiovascular and uh, uh, diabetes problem. Asthma or COPD uh, come in, pero it is not actually something that is uh, scary, pero we have to be careful because you have already a compromised uh, pulmonary function. Madali kasing magbronkos pa sa biglang mahirapang huminga. So, yun yung reason why. I would like to say that is the reason why. Kasi hindi pa lang what uh, pulmonologists or lung specialists will tell us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Doc Rick. Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, other questions. Uh, but before that, to our dear participants, uh, if you were late or you were not able to catch up the earlier part of uh, Doc Rick's um, uh, webinar, you may uh, re, uh, you may replay, you may watch the replay uh, through our Facebook page, and uh, we will try to upload uh, or transfer the video to our um, YouTube channel after this uh, webinar, so that you can have your uh, you can uh, replay it. Uh, and please don't forget to like our Twitter account and YouTube channel, um, uh, PGCA Philippine Counselor for our YouTube and uh, for our Twitter, official PGCA. Uh, Doc Rick, um, according to some doctors, patient diagnosed as COVID-19, but uh, 
as COVID-19 positive but asymptomatic has a very low possibility to infect others. Does it mean na hindi talaga sila uh, makakahawa or makahawa? Well, actually, we do not have a uh, straightforward statistics on this. But based on pathophysiology, if there are people who are asymptomatic, nakakahawa pa rin sila. But we tend to believe that they are asymptomatic for two reasons. One, they had a few of the viruses that they caught kontiling nakuha nilang mikrobyo. O pangalawa, they have a strong immune function system or immune system. So uh, it is not safe to say that uh, when they're asymptomatic, hindi na sila nakakahawa. Of course, there's a chance na makahawa sila. So kaya nga sinasabi natin, if you're asymptomatic, you just stay at home now, nag-isa ka sa room, wala kang kasama kasi you might still infect. So we quarantine just to be sure, 11 to 14 days, sabi ko na 14 days. Uh, but as I tell you, the recommendation of the specialists and the experts are changing over time. As data come in, we try to check kung ano na nga ba tama ba yung ating recommendation. And we are basing our facts on the cases that we saw before. And over time, pag marami ng kaso, we will now to see kung tama tayo after all. So if you ask me, hindi ba sila nakakahawa? We are not sure. Pero ang chances na hindi sila nakakahawa, of course, that should be higher. Okay, thank you, Doc Rick. Uh, yes. I think this is uh, an interesting question because you have mentioned about uh, Fabunan, uh, antiviral inject injection. So there, there's a question from one of our participants. Uh, is it okay uh, with you to answer this one? Or shall we pass for now? What, what is the question? Uh, what's with the Fabunan antiviral injection and others are claiming that it can cure? Uh, this, this is, uh, of course, I would like to answer that, you know, um, in medicine, when we make a recommendation, they undergo several phases of clinical trial from in vitro, the laboratory, and then we go into uh, animal models, and then we go to human trials. So there is an ethics involved there. At the same time, uh, we recommend uh, protocols you know, or, 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 or drug treatment or uh, um, combinations of drug, when we have seen the data that it does really uh, um, bring to treatment. So the issue here is how many patients was this randomized? Was, this, uh, was there a control? And then what were the parameters? Na ECG ba sila? Na X-ray ba sila? Or ano pa ibang mga sakit? So, uh, uh, he's a Filipino like me, but we know in, in science, we cannot afford to say pwede na to kasi it might be anecdotal. Pero kung pwede talaga, you know, uh, let us see the evidence for, for, or are the studies to prove and show. You're dealing kasi with science, so we really have to be very careful with this. Because once you endorse something, there will be a lot of people going to do it, but we don't have control. So importante, Meron tayong control and we can monitor the adverse reaction to this. So that is not just for the pabunan board, for all drugs. We look into that. What is the uh, uh, printed outcome na nilalagay nila na ito ang gagawin niya no, ito sa kanila mga literature. Pero ang tanong, nasa yung mga studies? We would like to see studies. So it has to be backed up with studies because we have to protect our population. Not for anybody, but for everyone. We have to protect everyone that these drugs have undergone rigorous, uh, what do you call that, um, investigation for its effectivity because we have to spend money. Second, we have to be careful with life. But so it is not against anybody. It is a scientific um, pronouncement that you have to show us evidences. And the evidence should be uh, enough proof that it does cure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Doc Rick. Now, uh, COVID-19, uh, this is, kumbaga, as they would say, uh, this is a warfare where, wherein hindi mo makikita yung kalaban mo. Uh, there is uh, this uh, question, uh, what are the physiological indicators that a patient has coped or recovered from COVID-19? And what are the possible may... Uh, may go home orders for the patient who has recovered from COVID-19? 
Of course, when the patient, how does a patient recover? There is clearing of the pneumonia if the patient had pneumonia. The vital signs, which is which are your, which is actually by, are, are your blood pressure, the cardiac rate, the respiratory rate, the temperature, they start to normalize. And then so the, the functional impairment starts to be okay. So he could talk, he could walk, there is no fever. Uh, although, as I said, um, cough is one of the last things that, you know, uh, get out of the patient system. Magaling na. And then, of course, that's why they test for RT, no RT-PCR. They test kapag negative ka na, ibig sabihin, wala na kung positive ka before, hindi ka na. Pero sabi nga natin, meron pa rin yung false negative. But still, meron din false positive. Yung sinabi ko kanina, you still have fragments of non-viable PCR, positive ka pero magaling ka na. So it boils down to the fact na one, look at the symptoms. If the patient goes back to the pre-symptomatic or pre-disease function, most likely he's okay. Second, look at the laboratory. Have they started to normalize? And of course, you look at the totality of the whole experience. Kumusta na? Uh, nakakaintindi pa ba siya? Okay pa ba ang sistema niya and everything? These are signs that uh, are uh, signs and symptoms of magaling na yung pasyente. So, sabi ko nga, yung ubo, you cannot use it as a parameter because in our study, it showed that magaling ka na, umuubo ka pa rin. So, all the physiologic, maybe you, sabi nga natin, adrenaline from the adren adrenal glands, it will increase, it will cause uh, blood pressure, uh, and it will cause um, tachycardia or increased heart rate. Pag nag-normal na ito, you treat that of course, no? with beta blocker probably, or mga gamot na pampababa ng blood pressure at heart rate. At pag inalis mo na yung gamot, okay naman na siya. Magaling na yung pasyente. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rick. Uh, I think may isa pang uh, pahabol talaga kasi uh, one of our defenses is of course our face mask. No? Uh, yes. May nagtatanong, Uh, siguro as we uh, we would like to repeat oh, yeah yung kanina yung uh, sinabi mo on uh, how do we clean our face mask kasi may nagtanong dito can we use alcohol to clean the disposable face mask so that we can use it again or it might be on the N95 again again we would like to ask you how how what are the possible ways to kasi uh, we we kumaga less yung ano natin eh uh, uh, maybe financial or material resources, what are the possible things we can do to these masks? Or can you recommend uh, a cloth or yeah, uh, how, to do, how to do with these masks as well? Okay, uh, first, uh, for surgical masks, of course you do, you do the, there, the different masks, there are indications of course. The KN95 or the N95 will be better because uh, There is an ionic bond. Hindi siya ordinary itong mga ito, no? even the surgical mask. Now, yung tanong is, your surgical mask, basically, one day use lang yan. No? Kasi sabi ko nga, hindi ba, it can stay seven days in the mask. And if you can't, but there, I would like to forewarn you that, in fact, you can actually go into the uh, DOH uh, algorithm or guideline by on. It does have a... Uh, recommendations on how to deal with these face masks. So yung sabi ko kanina, a recent study which is just yesterday showed that wet pa paper towels, you can use it as an insert. No, You uh, soak it in the uh, saline solution and you can put it when it dries. You can put it as part of your, your surgical mask or part of your mask. Na parang insert lalagay mo it can increase its filter, filter or, or obstructing effect from microorganisms. That was a, conduct, a study conducted in the United States that they were able to show. So yung may face mask, if you remember the graph, 0% yung walang face mask, pero yung may ginamit na, na ordinary clothing ba yun? 26%, pero pag gumamit ng surgical mask, 80%. So yung sagot dun is, well, if it is clothes, you can wash it and you can air dry it and sun dry. Uh, you just use detergent. Detergent naman will kill the microorganism. So, kung gusto nyo naghuhugas kayo, it's better to use your cloth mask. And I would suggest you put a filter in between. No? Maybe you put, um, yung sinabi ko, paper towel that has, uh, that has been soaked in uh, salt and dried, then you can put that. Yung surgical face mask, 
uh, you can actually consult the literature in the, in the producer and the one recommended by the DOH and the uh, group. No, so ito you don't wash it no with water no. Uh, sun dry, you can use. But yung N95, you do not sun dry that. It will destroy the mask. Kasi merong lattice effect. And there is a special, there is a special, uh, what do you call this? Um, I couldn't show it to you. There is a special uh, quality or formation of this particular mask that when you put it under the sun, you destroy it. So, Cloth mask, you can wash. Surgical mask, you do not wash the surgical mask. Maybe you can just air dry, maybe one or two days. Unless you're going to the hospital, please use a clean mask just to be safe. For those uh, frontliners, there is a recommendation for the type of mask and the number of hours or days that you could use them. I don't want to veer into um, uh, hypothesizing, it is an exact science. Let us see the study. Unfortunately, hindi ko na-download yung galing sa DOH. I was supposed to present it a while ago on if you do the washing, it might um, compromise the fil filtration ability of the mask. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Doc Rick, for accommodating uh, uh, some of the questions from our participants and to our participants who would like to apologize uh, sa hindi po na bring up na mga katanungan. Uh, we are overwhelmed by your questions. We really appreciate your questions. However, uh, we are short of time. So before we end, uh, uh, reminders lang po sa ating mga participants. First, uh, please do answer your post-test and evaluation. So a link will be provided uh, on a separate post sa PGSA official page. And remember, we have only one hour to answer it. Again, we have only one hour to answer it. So... Uh, E-certificates will be emailed to your email addresses indicated in your registration and post-evaluation. And please give us time to send it to you. Uh, we would like also to thank yung ating uh, certificates team. Uh, sila po ito yung nag uh, work out sa ating mga certificates, thousands of certificates. Uh, we have uh, Sir Dan uh, Talusan, our secretary, uh, Ma'am MC Garcia, our Assistant Secretary. Then we have uh, uh, yung ating staff sa PGSA office. Uh, sa PGSA office. Uh, Ms. Juvie Ann De Leon and Mr. Vince Sarcon. And of course, uh, Ms. Justin Joyce Bual. Uh, then another reminder po sa ating mga uh, participants, Please be aware or please be sensitive that when you type in your, e your email addresses, uh, unless it is uh, in caps lock or in all capital letters, then you have to type in the all caps. Pero uh, please follow yung email addresses nyo kung ano po nakalagay so that hindi na tayo magpaulit-ulit or uh, yung time natin po uh, hindi masayang uh, regarding the sending or correcting your uh, certificates. Po. Then the schedule for upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, for the next week, we have uh, Doc Julian Monta Montano for tele and web counseling. Uh, that would be on June 9 and June 12. We have Father RC again for facing uh, grief during the pandemic. Please stay tuned. Baka meron tayong uh, uh, on June 12. Uh, but please wait for the final announcement. This is uh, what I am uh, projecting or uh, showing to you is only the first batch of our webinar series. Uh, we have a second batch of webinar series that would uh, end until or would run for the whole month of uh, June. Okay, so our dear participants, uh, please uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook, PGSA Official, on our Twitter account, uh, P Official PGSA, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, PGSA Philippine 
counselor. Uh, so uh, with that, we thank you for your uh, time and for your participation. And uh, please remember there is no help, no health without mental health. So with that, thank you and good night.